to you. Alleluia, alleluia. Welcome as we continue the study on the kingdom of God. Today we will look at the authority of the kingdom. Okay, so last time that we met, last week, we uh, dove into what the kingdom of God is and why it is so confusing to the body of Christ. So, now that we understand the need to study what the kingdom is, we're going to start by taking a look at the authority of the kingdom and how it applies to us. But, to fully understand the authority of the kingdom, we of course need to take a look at two specific words, power and authority. So power uses, is, comes from the word dunamis, and it can be described as having capacity. It can mean to have the ability to carry something out, to bring something, or to conclude something. It can also denote spontaneity. In classic Greek, dunamis means the power to achieve in the area of physical, military, or political power. Dunamis is also used to translate two Hebrew words in the Old Testament. These words generally refer to military power of force. So the overwhelming proof of the power of God in the Old Testament, one place you can look at is the miraculous deliverance of Israel at the Red Sea. But even greater than that, the more comprehensive demonstration of the power of God is in the creation. In Micah 3, 8, Micah talked about the power of God working in him. He said a certain thing, and it was misinterpreted. What Micah was not saying <laughs> is that he is filled with both the power and Holy Spirit. What he was saying is he is filled with Holy Spirit, who is the power exercised through him by God. So now we have a good idea of what power is, let's take a look at authority. Exousia. <coughs> it can be defined as the unrestrained right or freedom of action. The verbal form of the word means to exercise one's right. The right of a king to rule because of his authority. The word can also mean the authorization of an officer or a messenger to carry out a specific task. Exousia is only used about people, not things. In the Old Testament, God delegated authority to world leaders. God installs and removes kings, Daniel 2.21 and then 4.31. In Daniel, the authority vested in the Son of Man is endowed by God. This same authority is given to the true Israel, the bride of Christ. So now we're going to take power and authority, and we're going to take a look at it as the power and authority of believers. Power, remember that's dunamis, has its foundation in the idea of being anointed. While authority, exousia, has its foundation in the concept of being sent out. By combining these two simpler concepts, we're presented with a unique aspect of the power and authority of a believer. It is that a believer is anointed and he is sent out with delegated authority to be used as the one who sent him and anointed him how he desires. Jesus told us that he was sending us out just as the Father sent him. <coughs> anointed, and empowered. Jesus expelled demons by exercising the authority delegated to him by Father through Holy Spirit. 
By watching and listening to his father, Jesus deprived Satan and his demonic host of their power, their ability to do the evil that they were so bent on doing, thereby destroying the works of Satan by snatching men from the rule of Satan. Jesus passed the same authority to his disciples. And we find that in Mark 10.1, Mark 3.15, 6.7, and Luke 10.19. John 1.12 tells us that everyone who receives Jesus receives from Jesus the power, the exousia, to become God's child. Now, when you look at that verse, there's three words that are very important for us to understand. One of them is the word gives. God gives to those who believe the right to become his child. Well, that leads us to the next word, the right. John isn't speaking of power as an ability to do a certain task but to gain a status. Jesus gives those who believe full authority to become, to be who they were created to be. John uses that term, the third word, children. He uses children to draw attention to the fact that God's kingdom is a community and a family. And as part of the family, we are partakers of the divine nature of our Father. So when we believe and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are given authority, we are given the right and the power to change our status from children of Satan to being children of God. Jesus taught that we have been given authority, once again, exousia, the right to use God's power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, an example of how you can use power and authority, let's take a police officer. He's out there direct, directing traffic. The police officer does not have the power to stop a car. The car is much bigger than he is. It's much heavier than he is. It's got momentum. It's going to run over him. But the police officer does have the authority to stop a car simply by raising his hand because the government has delegated its authority to that police officer. This same concept, the same idea as with the police officer, applies to us. God has passed his authority to us through Jesus, who sent his Holy Spirit to continue his ministry in and through us. We have been empowered, Acts 1.8, to do his work. We have the responsibility to exercise the power and the authority he has given us. For us... It's only a matter of using the authority given to us as members of the family of God so that we can be about doing the work of Jesus in this present evil age. We have the authority to use his power to bring the rule of God, God's kingdom, into this age on a daily basis. Each and every one of us, through the power in the name of Jesus, are possessors of the authority of all heaven, the rule of God. The authority, this authority, is that which comes only through the name of Jesus. But remember, Jesus says we have the keys of the kingdom. If you stop and think about it, this is really some great news for us because keys represent authority. Mm -hmm. We possess the keys of the kingdom. In other words, you and I have authority in his name. Now, we all know that Jesus possesses all authority 
Matthew 28, 18 is where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in on earth. earth. Amen. A lot of people forget that second half. Mm -hmm. He has he has the authority on earth. So what kind of authority did we see Jesus <coughs> possessing in Scripture? Okay. Authority to command wind and waves. Mm -hmm. The disciples were fearing for their lives when Jesus simply spoke a word. A word of authority over the wind and the waves to calm the sea. He demonstrated that he had the ability to heal the cripple. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda, unable to walk for so many years, saw and experienced the authority of Jesus when he simply said, pick up your bed and walk. The authority to open a blinded man's eyes. A man who was blind for his entire life saw the sign of authority, pun intended, after Jesus applied simple mud to his eyes, and by his authority, the man could see. Here's the one that, that tickles me the most. Jesus had the authority to stop a funeral. <laughs> By his word of authority, when he said, Lazarus, come forth, the dead came to life. That's just four small examples to give you a sense of the authority, the rule of God in his kingdom. Now, Jesus summoned his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So who did Jesus consider to be his disciples? The twelve? Mm -hmm. well, now we've got to stop and think, because when he was resurrected, he came back and he visited 500 disciples. <laughs> His disciples are the ones that believe they have a relationship with Him. That's it. This is the authority that He makes available to us when we call upon His name and when we allow Holy Spirit to enable us to walk in our identity and enable us to fulfill our God-given purpose. Jesus has passed, he's delegated this very same authority to his joint heirs. If you haven't figured it out, that's every Christian who has gained that personal one-on-one -on -one love relationship that is needed so that we can abide in him. We all know that Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, and as he will be tomorrow. So the same authority that he gave his disciples back then, he gives to us now as his disciples. Mm -hmm. We have that same authority. Now, you can take a look at the disciples, and you can see how <coughs> each one exercised that authority to a different degree. We have some disciples that went around and Holy Spirit chose to use them to heal people. He chose others to do other things. But we, because for some reason we've been taught comparison is a good thing and it's really not, start putting them on different levels because of what scripture says they did. <clears throat> but in reality, they're all at the same level because they did what daddy asked them to do. <clears throat> Jesus called his disciples then and he calls his disciples now to himself. <clears throat> and he does that so that he can give us authority. 
we receive this authority because of our relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus. So, our authority, if you want to really boil it down to the simple fact, is based solely on our relationship with Jesus, which is why we must maintain that relationship. Because apart from Jesus, we are lost and we are without authority. There are examples of trying to use false authority. Mm -hmm. And by false authority, I'm talking about attempting to do something under your own power mm -hmm. or in the name of another person. And the example is in Acts 19, verses 15 through 17. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was in leapt on them and subdued them all, overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and fear came upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. So why did this happen? Because they had no relationship with Jesus, and because they were relying in the power in the name of another man. Do you remember who the other man was and whose name they were using? Paul. Now, if you're going to pick a guy, that would make sense. But they got a little fire kicked out of him because the authority that Paul was exhibiting wasn't his own. But Paul had a relationship with Jesus. Therefore, he had the authority, the right, to exercise that power. And the, the, the spirit thought he would have a little fun and, and did strip him naked and chase him out of the house. I mean, he just, he just made a debacle of him. But because of our relationship with Jesus, we have the authority of his name. We have the authority to accept and use the power of those gifts that he promises each one of us, but to use them as he directs. Too many Christians learn, or they never learn, that they have been given this authority. Too many grow up spiritually corrupt with the misunderstanding that there's only a select few who have this authority, and if you're not part of that group, then you don't have it. Until they learn that this gift is meant for them as well, they will continue to remain in their spiritually crippled state. Now, <clears throat> there are some people in the church who know about this authority, but then they choose not to use it because they're uncomfortable. <clears throat> These people are spiritually crippled by choice. Mm. And they need to learn how to accept and use their God-given authority. Mm -hmm. After all, you can be a millionaire, but if you don't know how to write a check, mm -hmm. you're going to live in poverty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with us. We have an unlimited bank account <clears throat> that Daddy is willing to draw from and exercise through us. Remember the example of we keep talking about. Jesus only did and said what he heard Daddy say and do. Mm -hmm. If we stick to that, then this authority, the right to exercise the power, the rule of God, is natural. It flows smoothly. But as soon as we take our eyes off of listening and watching him and try to go on our own, we are literally on our own. So, Christian that never uses God's authority becomes defeated, lives in despair, and is despondent. So we're going to talk about each one of them.
A defeated Christian. You know any of these? They're the ones who say, every time I take a stand, I get knocked down. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think I'll just quit trying. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been in an assembly where there's cliques and people love using cliches, then there's a phrase that you've probably heard or even said yourself. Bell's just beating me down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then there's the Christians who live in despair. And I bet you you know someone in this too. Because what you hear is, I'll never live in victory. I hear it preached. I see it in others' lives. But there's no hope for me. And they will quote a verse to you. It'll be Psalms 34, 19. <clears throat> Problem is, they only read the first half. The first half says, Many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous. Comma. And that comma is actually followed by a but. The Lord rescues them from them all. <clears throat> Read to the end of the sentence at least. And then we have the despondent Christians. These are the people that have the thought process of it's bound to happen. Oh well, Satan's been attacking me. Oh well, my family's in turmoil. Oh well, my health is being attacked again. I guess it was inevitable. It's true. The adversary is always out to get you. But if you live, if you abide under the authority of God, you can speak in the name of Jesus and make the adversary leave you alone. Mm -hmm. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God. Resist mm -hmm. the devil. Resist the thoughts. Resist the adversary. And he will flee from you. Saying it was inevitable or it was bound to happen at some, at some point is admitting defeat and giving up your God-given authority without even trying to use it. So we need to be aware of our authority as believers. And we need to be aware of the fact that the use of it can be weakened in us because of us. If we don't pursue our relationship with God, and we don't accept and use His authority as He directs, we can, in fact, become weak and need a jump start, just like an old battery does. However, when we learn to use our God-given authority as believers, we become destructive, we become determined, and we become deployed. Now that first one threw you for a loop. How can a Christian be destructive? Well, it's easy. We become destructive to the enemy's kingdom. This is when the adversary takes notice and he begins to fear us. As we develop our love relationship with Jesus and we accept the power and authority, Jesus shows us our weapons. Those weapons that allow us to stand before any demon, before any adversary that comes against us. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the kingdom of God, against the rule of God, and we are taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we start with that, but then we move on to where we are a determined Christian. We are overcoming. We are victorious. And nothing that the enemy throws at us can stop us. It is through this authority, the authority that we receive through Jesus, that we have the power to trample on the darts and the snares of the adversary. Anything he wants to throw at us, we are able to handle because we abide in him. We stand on his truths 
And guess what? He deals with it. So the enemy's power, when you look at it, sees, sees huge, like it's a raging fire. But because of knowing who we are, knowing what our purpose is, and part of that is understanding that we have this power and authority, that raging fire turns into a little itty bitty spark that can't do anything. And because of that, the enemy, the adversary, begins to lose his hold and his power over us. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I've given you authority, the right to tread yeah. on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. Nothing will injure you. Why do we immediately go to the flesh when we hear that? Mm. We were made in His image. We were made spirit beings first. Our spirit cannot be crushed by the enemy. This he can mess with if daddy allows it. But then we can mess with this because we make bad choices. If as long as we abide in him, as long as we listen and watch what daddy's doing, the odds of us choosing incorrectly diminish. And it's because of that love relationship. <clears throat> Everything comes down to our identity in Him and our relationship with Him that makes all of this come together and it confounds the adversary because he just can't understand it. So we, we took a quick look at, at two of them, but the third one is the deployed Christian. Dependent upon which assembly you go to, what denomination, you've probably heard this, but I don't know if you've heard it this way. We are deployed Christians every day. We are deployed onto the front lines of combat where we stand prepared to do battle against the forces of evil. The key word is we are prepared and we stand and we watch Jesus do the fighting for us. One of the things I love most in, in, in Scripture when we start talking about battle is He's before me. He is behind me and He's beside me. I am completely surrounded by Jesus Christ. Who can defeat Him? Nothing. You want to talk about being in a secure place? Mm -hmm. But that secure place comes out of your love relationship, abiding in Him, understanding your identity in Him, and more importantly, Him in you. Yes. So, are you beginning to see the scope and the power that Jesus has delegated to us? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not something that we can obtain on our own. It is purely the power of God working in us and through us. There is an invisible war a raging battle being fought for the soul of every man. And we are able to stand in him as he takes the battle to the enemy. When we finally learn to operate in the God-given authority that we possess as Christians, then nothing that the adversary does to stop us is going to succeed. Does this mean that the enemy is going to stop? No, nah, he's going to try, but all of his attempts will result in failure as long as we abide in him. So, when I say abide in him, we have to remember the prayer of Jesus in the garden, that prayer of unity. Your Father, Son, and Spirit are one. And Jesus prayed that we would be one in Him, which means we are in Father, we are in Son, we are in Holy Spirit, and 
They are in us. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The scary part is Ron's in me. Deb's in me. <laughs> this young man sitting over here is in me because we are all united. One in him. So once, once we begin to understand that, then we begin to understand some of these verses in scripture that puzzle us sometimes. If one in the body hurts, the rest of the body suffers. If one in the body rejoices, the rest of the body celebrates. That's what it means. That's why he used the term children to focus on community and family. So it really is time for us to accept and to use the authority that Jesus gives to each one of us. We must be willing to use this God-given gift of power and authority if we want to become that destructive, determined, and deployed Christian in service to Jesus our Lord. The kingdom of heaven has authority over the earth and over all laws, whether they're natural or spiritual. The kingdom of heaven, the rule of God, has that authority over every law that there is. He proved it in Scripture. He made the sun go backwards. Not forwards. That would have been too easy. He made it go backwards. He brought the dead to life. I mean, it is just a, amazing. If you take a look at the miracles of Jesus, they were a demonstration of how the authority of the kingdom of God has dominion over any condition on earth. To the degree that we abide in the kingdom, by abiding in the king, we too can walk in authority over any condition on the earth. As we approach the end of this age, the word can will change to must. Mm -hmm. Scripture says it will get worse. So you can see how the can really turns into a must. It's the only way we will be able to survive what's taking place is we must abide in Him. In John 14, 12, the Lord said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. But then he went on. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Je Jesus demonstrated this with his life. And this is what he has called us to walk in. It is a high calling. And such authority can only come by abiding in the king who is above all war, above all authority, and above all dominion. So our primary goal is not just to have this power or authority at the end of this age. The, his body, the church, is going to demonstrate his power and authority to prepare the way for his coming kingdom. How? Because our goal isn't just to possess the power and authority, but to be in relationship with the one who has all power and authority. You getting the theme? Relationship. <laughs> Identity. It's all wrapped up in this. I mean, the identity of Jesus has all this power. But because of our relationship with Him, because we are co-heirs with Him by declaration of the Father, when we listen, when we see, and then we do what we hear and what we saw, as He wants us to, He will enable us. He will have that power and authority go before us when we enter those situations.
the authority of the kingdom will coincide with the gospel of the kingdom being preached. Okay, where do we find that one in scripture? Do we? Probably not. But it's only logical that it's through the preaching of the gospel explaining to those who don't have a relationship with Jesus why we have one. Isn't that what the gospel is? Explaining the hope that's within us, how we can be content, as Paul said, in any circumstance, because we know who we are. In him, we know who he is in us. We know what he wants us to do because we're listening and we're watching. And we trust him enough that when he asks us to do something that he's already doing. Yeah. So let's see. If he started a work, he will finish the work. But he's asking us to join him where he's working because that's why we were created and given not only his image, but we were given special gifts, talents, a certain sphere of influence people that no one else would be able to reach. So, that's how you can tie the power and authority with the preaching of the gospel. One basic characteristic of one who walks in this authority is that they will be in unity with one another. We keep focusing on the unity with Daddy, Son, and Spirit. For some reason, we forget about the unity with each other. Same Spirit, same Daddy, same Son that's in me is in each one of you. How will you, they know that you are my disciples? Not our love for the world, but our love for one another. The way we love and treat, honor, and respect other members of the family. This authority that we've been talking about can only come from abiding in the king and those who are rightly joined to the king will also be rightly joined to the rest of the body. There is no greater adventure that one can have in this life than walking the life that he's put before you. And there are no more exciting times that have ever existed on earth than the ones that we are entering into. We were placed in a specific point in time, location. We were placed into history for a purpose. Once you discover what that purpose is, you can't help but get excited. Mm. Yep. Even so, the greatest miracle of, of all will be the unity of God's people and their love for one another. The miracles will be exciting, but the unity and the love is what makes it possible and will be even more important, more convincing, and more wonderful. Above all things, and above seeing all these great miracles, we must continue to pursue loving God, being in relationship with Him by abiding in Him and demonstrating our love for Him by loving His people. From the time when there were just two brothers on the earth, they couldn't get along. One of them basically said, the world ain't big enough for both of us. <laughs> Funny, we're laughing at, but really, that, that could have been what he was saying. People, clans, and nations have been in conflict ever since. When the body of Christ matures, and when she becomes what she's called to be, she will be in such unity that the world will marvel at it. 
Jesus himself prayed to the Father in John 17, 22 to 23. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me. That they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you did send me and love them even as you have loved me. As we see in that verse, the glory that will be revealed to, upon, and through God's people, as stated in Isaiah 61 through 2 and other places, it's there to show that we can be one in Him. When this happens, the world will know that Jesus was indeed sent by the Father, and we will know that He loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. Those who experience this glory are bonded in a special way that is hard to describe or understand until you experience it. This glory simply erases the pettiness, the lack of forgiveness that separates so many Christians. It is beholding his glory with an unveiled face as we continue to be changed into His image. Our first calling is to be like Him. Our second calling is to do the works that He did. If we are like Him, we will walk in love. And when we walk in love, He can trust us with His power and his authority. For those who walk in love, it becomes the greatest treasure that allows us to be who we were created to be. The image of the one who sent Jesus and you into the world. The one who is love. Love is only expressed through relationships. Love is only expressed to those who have been identified as worthy to receive that love. So when it comes down to the power and authority, it really does come down to he loves us so much that he trusts us with his power and his authority because of our relationship with him where he can speak to us and show us what he wants us to say and what he wants us to do so that his power and glory can be demonstrated in the world that glorifies him. Another way of spreading the gospel. So that's all I have for tonight. I will tell you that I originally had one page Daddy, four and a half. So out of the 240 pages of notes that I have, I've covered one. So are there any questions, any questions about tonight? I do. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke about um, his coming kingdom. Mm -hmm. The kingdom is here. Yes, it is. You sure made your last week. <laughs> Last week we did cover the fact that, it, that, that presently the kingdom of God is here and it is in heaven. But when we talk about the future kingdom, it is the physical presence of his kingdom coming in Jerusalem. So when we when we hear people talk about the future. That's what they're really talking about. The kingdom's here. The rule of God is already here. It's just that he's going to move the throne to a new location. But you said that that, that that second coming is coming for the Jews because the kingdom of God was for the Gentiles. That's what the word, I mean, says. It says he comes for Israel. We are Israel. Yeah, it's from both. We're adopted. We're adopted into the family, into the, into 
to the the family of Israel. Yeah. Mm. They chose the term nation because that was better understood. If you had a nation, you had a kingdom. So it became easier for people to understand. But as you mature, you begin to understand, like Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My daddy sits on the throne up there, but I'm down here as an ambassador, and wherever I go, the kingdom's there. And the thing is, Pontius Pilate would have understood that. Because he was actually fulfilling that role for Caesar. A man under authority in a foreign land exercising the power and authority of the one who sent him. That's what we're called to do. So, when you talk about the coming, it's the coming physical presence. This is the way that I would look at it. And the reason why I say that is because in the millennium, it's coming for the Jews. And during the time in which, prior to the death of Christ, to the beginning of Paul's ministry, that was all for the Gentiles because the Jews rejected him. And when they rejected Christ, to the stoning of Stephen, mm -hmm. God took his hand from the nation of Israel. So the, the time of the Gentiles, um, people will argue about. Some will say that the time of the Gentiles ended when uh, Israel came into being as a separate nation and country. That's, that's one way of looking at it. The way I look at it, feel free to disagree. Mm -hmm. Time of the Gentiles ends when the last Gentile is adopted into the family. And no one knows when that's going to be. But I will agree with you that during the tribulation, the remnant yes of the nation of Israel, the nation as we know it, will, will become members of true Israel. That 144,000 mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> So, remember the millennium is peace. A thousand years of peace. The horrible ending. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time.